Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. I'm Mary Mate. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com is our website. Go there, support the show, get bonus content, including your weekly Thursday throwdown, where we provide you a midweek dose of media madness. They don't get to on this show and on Monday morning. So yeah. go sign up. Go sign up. It's a great time. And you also get extended interviews. What's not to love? Well, uh, should we get to the four basic food groups? Democrats suck, Republicans suck. Uh, isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? Let's do it. What do we have for Democrats suck? So former Senator Claire McCaskill has some interesting insights into what is happening in Palestine. And she's really concerned for, of course, the victims of all of this, which is Israel. Let's take a listen. It might be time for us to back up and look at this um, from the very beginning and realize what Hamas has accomplished here. They, a, a horrible terrorist organization that wants nothing more than to wipe Israel off the face of the planet, went into Israel and committed atrocities knowing what Netanyahu's reaction would be. Knowing. Okay, so a couple of things here. What we're seeing as Senator, former Senator who lost her Senate seat, uh, Claire McCaskill is talking about, as she's blaming Hamas, we're seeing images of Rafa on fire. And as people know, there was an Israeli air attack on tents housing displaced people in Rafa that killed at least 40 Palestinians, including children. And people were burned alive. They exploded. They were beheaded. It was absolutely awful. And she thinks this is a good idea to talk about how it's Hamas's fault because they knew Israel was going to do this, which is typical kind of abuse language. Like, look what you made me do. You made me beat you by mouthing off to me. Look what you made me do, uh, Israel, uh, Hamas. You made me commit genocide. That this would stop the progress of normalizing relationships between Israel and other Arab nations in the Middle East knowing that there would be a disproportionate response. And when I say disproportionate, I mean numbers of civilians killed. I'm not saying that there's anything that Israel has done that comes close to the, 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 the horrible atrocities that were purposely committed by Hamas back on October 7th. Okay, so here what she's doing is she is once again trying to not criticize Israel. So she acknowledges, interestingly enough, the truth, which is that Israel responds with disproportionate force. That's kind of an unofficial Israeli doctrine of war. But she doesn't want to blame Israel for that. In fact, she's saying that their disproportionate force is not as bad as what happened on October 7th. How can you look at the murder of tens of thousands of people with the most advanced weaponry and heavy weaponry in the world, We're talking about 2,000 pound bombs, slamming into apartment buildings, you know, uh, refugee tents, and say that nothing that Israel has done compares to what Hamas did on one day on October 7th, in which about 800 or so civilians were killed. It's like, it's so sad. How, I mean, what kind of a mind comes up with that? Of course, this is very normal for corporate TV. Right. Like what, what universe are they in? It, it's hard to respond to because it's so crazy. Right. It's also crazy because she's saying it as if, Hamas is to blame for what they did, but Israel's not to blame for what it does. Like Israel responding with disproportionate force. And of course, when we say responding, that's kind of misleading because this this war did not begin on October 7th, right? But that's what these people like to say. But note that she's she's going out of her way to say Israel is doing nothing wrong. So she's embracing, openly embracing disproportionate force, also known as collective punishment also known as war crimes. And this is all the fault of Hamas, according to McCaskill. So Hamas has gotten, what they wanted more than anything was to isolate Israel. And frankly, you know what else they wanted? They wanted to recruit more extreme terrorists to their cause. And when you have something happen, like happened over the weekend, with these women and children being burned to death in a camp, innocents, that creates more radical terrorists for the Hamas cause. So what I would ask Benjamin Netanyahu at this point is what, what is the goal here? How do you think you're ever going to get ahead of this 
if by your actions, even if it is a tragic mistake, you're creating more of the very people you're trying to eliminate. It is really, I think it will go down as one of the, I, I don't know how even in the beginning he thought they could eliminate every single Hamas extreme terrorist in Gaza. So uh, it is what it is now, and I worry for Israel because of how they've been isolated on the world stage as a result of the, the just sheer volume of innocent citizens that have been killed. So again, she's very concerned, not with the civilians who have been killed, but what the effect of those killed civilians will be on Hamas and how Israel will suffer as a result. She's not really that uh, upset about the civilians being killed. She's upset about how that could affect Israel's standing in the world and its isolation. Only Democrats could look at uh, Israel committing mass murder, vowing to commit mass murder, vowing to flatten Gaza, vowing, vowing to basically leave it uninhabitable and say, what is the goal here? Like, what are you trying to achieve? Right, the right. goal is what you're seeing in front of your eyes. It's to destroy Gaza and displace and kill as many people as possible so that it's unlivable and to basically teach it. I'll say a lesson that if you dare resist our military occupation, we'll wipe you out. That's right. the goal. That's the goal. And it's like you're watching all this unfold before your eyes. You're seeing women and children, as she mentioned, being burned alive. And she still can't figure out that, like, the genocide is the point. Right. It's not it's not a bug. It's a feature. And again, Israel's doing nothing wrong, she says, as she also says that their killing of civilians is uh, counterproductive and self-destructive to Israel. So it's not morally or ethically wrong. They have the right to do it. It just may backfire, basically, is her takeaway. So what do we got for Republican suck? Republican suck, let's turn to former U.S. presidential candidate, former uh, U.N. ambassador Nikki Haley, who paid a visit to Israel in solidarity and did what pretty much every Republican politician has to do now when they go visit Israel, which is sign a little note on Israel's bombs. And this is what Nikki Haley wrote uh, on one Israeli bomb. There we go. Finish them. America loves Israel, as always. Nikki Haley. It's so sweet. Um, now, this was reported that these bombs were intended for Gaza, but actually, it was this was on the northern uh, border of Israel. So likely, this was intended for Lebanon, which Israel also routinely attacks. So that's Nikki Haley. And uh, she also, while she was there, decided to share her conspiracy theory that not only was Iran behind October 7th, but Russia was too. What I saw was very detailed. It's clear that they were informants. It's clear that this took years to plan. But make no mistake, this is one of the most brutal massacres I have ever experienced, heard about, seen the damages of. It was orchestrated by Iran. It was helped with Russian intelligence. And it was fueled by money from China. Don't deny that. China's been funding Iran the entire time. Russia's intelligence helped them know where everything was. Iran helped get them trained. So this isn't Hamas. Look at these, these are all murderers and accomplices. If we really mean it's never gonna happen again, we have to be honest and truthful with ourselves. Who did this? That's the first thing. Okay, so it wasn't just uh, Hamas. It also was Iran, Russia, and of course, China as well. I, I didn't mention that earlier. She right. says also China somehow paid for all this. So really, we have the entire uh, new axis of evil in there. Uh, Hamas, Russia, China, Iran. But she kind of buried the lead. The major piece of evidence to support her thesis is, of course, that uh, October 7th is Putin's birthday. Right. She's mentioned that before, that this was carried out on Putin's birthday. And so Putin, being the uh, you know devil that he is, the scheming devil that he is, decided to throw himself a birthday party by uh, orchestrating October 7th, right. by supplying intelligence to Hamas. I mean, I don't know where these people come up with this, but this is a former senior official in the U.S. government who, by the way, Donald Trump has said that if he wins uh, the presidency again, she'll be a part of his team. So despite their acrimony in the primary, um, the, the Republicans will always unite when it comes to helping Israel commit mass murder. 
this is our political spectrum. You have Genocide Joe and someone like Nikki Haley, who is even more unhinged. You know, Biden lies all the time, but I've never heard him say that like Russia, Iran, and China were all involved in October 7th. And in fact, U.S. intelligence has acknowledged that Iran did not have any uh, foreknowledge of October 7th. Well, obviously, Aaron, her finish them uh, call is a throwback to her saying that they should finish them, right? What she said on on television. And I just want to take a look at at the actual shell that she signed. I got to say, I am impressed by the squat because that indicates strong leg muscles and strong core. I can't really do that if I want to sign a shell, uh, which I don't think I'd want to. But if I did want to, I'd have to probably like bend over or sit down. But let's take a look at the what she wrote again. Finish them. America loves Israel. So America hearts Israel always. And then it, it, at first when I saw that, I thought it said Killer Ke- Killer Haley. Doesn't her name, doesn't the way she spells Nikki kind of look like Killer? <laughs> yeah, I can killer see Haley. that. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Or Killy, or Killy Haley. Killy Haley, yeah. Yeah. Which would be a cute nickname for her. Wow. Republicans certainly do suck. Well, for isn't that weird? We have a heartwarming story that comes from a writer, uh, journalist named Sam Forster. Now he's uh, based, he's a Canadian, Aaron. I'm sorry to tell you he's a Canadian, but he's French Canadian. So that's different from you, right? That is different from me, yes. So don't conf- confuse him with an Aaron kind of Canadian. So he tweeted out, uh, last summer, I disguised myself as a black man and traveled throughout the United States to document how racism persists in American society. Writing Seven Shoulders was one of the hardest things I've done as a journalist. It's out May 30th. And then there's a link, and then here's the cover of it. And for our audio-only people, uh, you're not missing much, but the image on the cover of the book is kind of a, looks like a cheap Picasso knockoff. It's a face that has green colors and white colors and brown and some red shoulder and a black hair. Uh, Not really sure what they're getting at. So let's take a look at how this book was reviewed on Goodreads. And the full title is Seven Shoulders Taxonomizing Racism in Modern America. And uh, it gets one, a one star. Uh, The description is six decades after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, award-winning journalist Sam Forster performs a daring transformation in order to taxonomize the various types of racism that persist in modern America. Seven Shoulders is the most important book on American race relations that has ever been written. So look out, W.E.B. Du Bois, Cornell West, Gerald Horn. You guys have nothing on Forster. Who knew that the most important book ever on American race relations would be written in 2024, not by a uh, black person, but by a Canadian white guy? Yeah, a white Canadian. Who knew? Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Yeah. And that, of course, th- those important books were not written in the 60s, uh, you know, even, even earlier, the 70s, uh, you know, uh, the era of civil rights and black power. They, it, it would come, um, you know, 60 years later. You need perspective. You need distance. Yeah, exactly. You need, you need, you need some time to pass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also, you need- the, you know, the distance of, of geography, too. So across the border, you have right. a real objective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of the reactions to this. We have Janelle Cubbage writing, instead of buying this book from a white author who traveled the country in blackface, read and listen to actual black people about our lived experience. Profiting off of blackface and racism is nasty work. Co- Kill a Court writes, you had to do blackface to understand the issues black people face. Hmm. Nice uh, alliteration there. And Jesus of the um, RIP show, uh, Jesus versus Marrow, has a picture of the author wearing a hat made out of African cloth. This actually was already made into a movie. Sam Forster is not the first person to take on this courageous transformation. Let's take a look at the wonderful 1980s film, Soul Man. Harvard Law School. Yeah! Yeah! Total for three years of law school. Wait a second, look at this. Full tuition for most qualified applicant, most qualified black applicant. $53,000. Nine hundred and seventy-nine dollars. Congratulations, Mr. Watson. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best. These are the '80s, man. It's the Cosby decade. For Mark Watson, all it took was a little soul. You know, there's something really strange about you, and I don't know what it is. Mom, Dad, 
I'm black. No? What? No, you're crazy. Soul man. He didn't give up. He got down. So there you have it. The original Seven Shoulders. Yeah, you know, in the '60s, there was a there's a famous book called Black Like Me, where a white writer donned uh, blackface. He uh, he darkened his skin. Uh, and it was a very famous book, and it was for a while considered to be a very important one. I don't know how they feel about it now. He documented from a white man's perspective what it's like to be black in, in America, and uh, I guess that was at a time of like legalized racism, and so it was received differently it was, it was received i think pretty positively and as important I, I mean i learned about it as a kid but we're now i mean we're talking about 2024 and a white canadian guy darkens his skin say. it's it's just uh it's uh, i mean I, he deserves the mockery <laughs> He, he I was going to say, he's, he wasn't Canadian, though. That's what this guy's, that's what Forster's con- unique contribution to uh, blackface literature <laughs> is. His, can- <laughs> his Canadian perspective, yeah. Yes, yes. A white Canadian in blackface. Right. What do we got for Isn't That Terrible? For Isn't That Terrible, Israel is very grateful to comedian Jerry Seinfeld. Because Jerry Seinfeld recently uh, did a sit-down interview with Barry Weiss, um, noted anti-Palestinian writer. She famously tried to get Palestinian professors fired when she was at Columbia University. Um, she targeted Rafat al She targeted Rafat al uh, and She um, very notably became like sort of a leading, one of these leading voices on, on the right to speak out against so-called woke identitarian politics and then became the number one purveyor of identitarian right. Zionist politics, constantly claiming that Jews are under threat in the U.S. Uh, simply because people out there are protesting Israel's mass murder. She also railed against cancel cancel culture, despite the fact that she engages in it. So just another gem of hypocrisy coming from Barry. So she recently sat down with Jerry Seinfeld and uh, had what Israel, the government of Israel, thought was a very powerful moment. Uh, because look at what Israel tweeted. So Israel has tweeted at Jerry Seinfeld with a heartbreaking emoji. Thank you. Very grateful to Jerry Seinfeld. And here's why. Let's let's hear what Jerry Seinfeld has to say to draw Israel's gratitude. You were in Israel yes. since the war started. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. was that trip? Uh, the most uh, powerful experience of my life. Really? I'm sure, yeah. Why? Um, you know, you just... Are you thinking of someone in particular? Um, Sorry. And for people who are just uh, listening, he nods after she says, are you thinking of someone in particular? Well, first she shrugs, then he nods, and then he grabs a tissue. So he can't even explain what was so powerful about the most powerful moment of his entire life. Like, can we get some detail, Jerry? Can we get something? It's too powerful, Aaron. You can't even express it. But this is the thing with Israel supporters is they just like, they don't feel the need to even have to uh, tell us why they love Israel so much. It's just ingrained. If you don't, if you don't already know it, you're somehow an anti-Semite. You know, right. you're a blue hater. Like when people walked out of Jerry Seinfeld's commencement speech or when they disrupted his his recent comedy shows, he called them Jew haters. There's this certain just sort of like entitlement about being a Israel supporter where you don't have to like explain anything, uh, produce any facts, offer any evidence, you really say anything. You can just nod and say, well, this is the most powerful experience of my life. Yeah. And we're all supposed to be touched by that. While meanwhile, you're silent or even supportive of Israel's uh, mass murder campaign. Right. Genocide just makes him so verklempt. Yeah, obviously. All right. So those have been your four basic food groups. We are so excited and honored to be joined by Francesca Albanese, who is a special rapporteur to the Palestinian occupied territories. She's going to be talking to us about her report, which she released called uh, Anatomy of a Genocide, where she documents why there is indeed an unfolding genocide happening to Palestinians. 
She's also going to be talking about the latest developments in terms of human rights and other news in Israel-Palestine. So here's Francesca Albanese. Francesca Albanese, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. Such an honor. There's so much to talk about with you, and you're so informed and an expert in so many areas. I guess I think to start off, let's just talk about the the latest in human rights law related to Palestine, human rights law news. And that, of course, is the ICJ decision telling uh, Israel to cease its attack in Rafa. What are your thoughts on that? And what is the effect of something like that? Does it even matter? It does. It does on so many levels. So first of all, this is the third time that the ICJ issues provisional measures. Uh, indicating under the umbrella that there is a plausibility of genocide being committed. So even without looking into the merit of the case, the court has recognized this, the, uh, the risk that the acts that Israel is committing in uh, uh, the Gaza Strip are not any crime, are crimes that might amount to genocide. So this is one. The second is that since January 26, the court has ordered Israel to conduct itself in line with the, the Genocide Convention, meaning uh, do not commit uh, acts of killing, infliction of severe bodily or mental harm, not creating conditions that would, of life that could lead to the destruction of the group, of uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, but I would say the Palestinians, that might amount to genocide, meaning that might uh, reflect the, the destruction of the people in total in part. And there is evidence of intent of destroy through these acts the, 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 the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And it has recommended measures like entry of humanitarian, delivery of humanitarian aid. Particularly in Rafa, it's important that while people are debating about semantics, how the ordered uh, how, how the order was framed and where the court put the commas. Is it saying that Israel is to halt his activities in Gaza, his hostility, or is it just saying that Israel is to, change, to uh, stop its hostilities in Gaza to the uh, point in my amount to genocidal acts? These are semantics. What has happened in the 48 hours after the um, ICJ render this new set of provisional measures uh, is uh, dozens of bombs uh, uh, thrown over Rafa, which is packed with IDPs. And of course, this turned into, into new tragedies, new murder of people. Uh, people were, 45 people were exploded or burned alive, including children. This is so abhorrent. And of course, does it matter as you, as you asked? Yes, of course, it, it should matter. It should matter for Israel. It should matter for the international community, which has set so many red lines, which continue to be crossed, and nothing happens. This is where we are right now. I guess that's what I meant when I said doesn't matter. I, I meant really, uh, will it have any effect on Israel's actions? It should. It should, because, you know, the, the Genocide Convention is the legal instrument that not par excellence, not only uh, criminalizes a given conduct and imposes an obligation to investigate and punish the commission of the crime, but it includes a, a prevention obligation. So every member state has to take all possible measures to prevent the commission of genocide. What does it mean to do everything possible to stop Israel from doing what it's doing, starting with uh, stopping transferring weapons to Israel, which is something that is not happening, first and foremost from the United States, but also a number of European countries, stopping prov providing uh, political, uh, economic, diplomatic support to Israel. And again, the fact that it doesn't happen the fact that the, the double standards and the hypocrisy of the West, notwithstanding the responsibility of many in the rest of the world, but the responsibility of the, of the West is so exposed and the double standards and the hypocrisy that put at risk the entire international legal system 
as it was born on the ashes of the of the victims of the Second World War. Now, you wrote um, an excellent report called Anatomy of a Genocide, where you determined that there was an unfolding genocide. Was anything about that report surprising to you? What was the most surprising part? Or did you really uh, know everything before? Did you suspect that there was genocide before the report? Well, I have to say that I've kept a close eye on what uh, Israeli, the Israeli military, the Israeli army has done in Gaza since the 8th of October. Now, there was already, as I say in the report, genocide is a process. It's not an act. And the process starts with the dehumanization of the other. So this was not new. I, I know that there was an, an, a deep rooted, uh, racism toward the Palestinians among Israelis, particularly in, in the Israeli army, because I've seen how they act against the Palestinians in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, uh, how the Israeli authorities act against the Palestinians. So I knew. But what has been absolutely shocking is to see what human beings, what Israelis, have been capable of. Now, let me say, I've also been shocked to see what Palestinians from Gaza, from armed groups emanating from Gaza, have been able to do on the 7th of October. This this just to just to qualify things. But what I say what I've seen the Israeli soldiers doing and boasting about since the 8th of October, it's absolutely unconscionable. Yes, I would not, I would have never expected that. And I would have not expected that eight months into this uh, brutality, much of the Israeli public, much of the Israeli society would support it. So while I understand how indoctrinated they are, while I understand that they're also, they're also victims because they've been educated to a racist ideology that leads them to fear the other, um, to despise the other. And on the 7th of October, they have seen many of their fears come, come, come true. At the same time, again, what has been done to the people in Gaza, the, the, the killing and maiming, the brutal arrest and detention, the torture, um, the starvation, and the, again, the boasting about this. This has been shocking. I wanted to play you a clip from uh, John Kirby, a White House spokesperson, uh, talking about the tent camp massacre in Rafah, where Israel slaughtered dozens of people, um, including some who were burned alive. Uh, the White House stayed silent for uh, a long time, but then finally was asked about it. And basically, Kirby said, well, we don't know if this crosses our red line, and we're going to leave it to Israel to investigate itself. This is what Kirby said. So how does this not violate the red line that the president laid out? As I said, we don't want to see a major ground operation. We haven't seen that at this point. How many more charred corpses does he have to see before the president considers a change in policy? We don't want to see a single more innocent life taken. And I kind of take a little offense at the question. No civilian casualties is the right number of civilian casualties. And this is not something that we've turned a blind eye to, nor has it been something we've ignored or neglected to raise with our Israeli counterparts, including, Ed, this weekend as a result of this particular strike. Now, they're investigating it, so let's let them investigate it and see what they come up with. But the president doesn't have, like, a personal limit to this? The president has been very clear and very direct about what our expectations are for Israeli operations in Rafah specifically, but in Gaza writ large. We don't support, we won't support a major ground operation in Rafah. Uh, and we've, again, been very consistent on that. And the president said uh, that should that occur, then it might make him have to make different decisions in terms of support. We haven't seen that happen at this and point. Why not have him come out and say that himself? The president has been speaking to leaders throughout the region on a regular basis. He has been addressing you guys in various fora. So two questions. When it comes to Israel investigating itself for its own atrocities, uh, what is the what is your view of, of their record on that? And what do you make of the Biden administration's claim that, well, this massacre in Rafah, along with many other bombings, 
they don't constitute a major military operation in Rafa. So therefore, there's no there's no red line triggered for us. Well, first of all, I have to say that I hadn't seen that clip and it's jaw dropping. This is uh, the reality. Uh, which alternate reality the US administration did see? Because, so let me answer the first question you asked regarding Israel's capacity to investigate violations of international law. It's not, it's not realistic. Israel has proven through and through unable and unwilling to investigate violations of international law against the Palestinians. This is the reality of 56 years of occupation. And I can tell you, the establishment of settlements after settlements that are a war crime, this is a state endeavor. This is not, I mean, the, the settlements do not mushroom in the occupied territory by accident or without being prompted and supported by the Israeli state. So uh, who's being investigated for that? The arbitrary arrest and detention of almost a million Palestinians who have been arrested and detained and often tortured in Israeli uh, jails, uh, prisons, uh, in, including in uh, mm, detention centers that are under the full control of the army. This is something that has never been accounted for. Look at the figures, the prosecution, the level of prosecutions of Israelis uh, char um, uh, for, for crimes committed against the Palestinians is 1% and normally results in very, very lenient charges. And um, on the other side, the level of conviction for Palestinians who have allegedly committed crimes against uh, against Israel and Israel as the occupying uh, power uh, is uh, 99%. So uh, the reason why Israel, Israel is being uh, investigated, Israeli leaders are being investigated and hopefully one day prosecuted by the International Criminal Court is because Israel has proven unwilling and unable to uh, comply with international law, including with the crimes, uh, uh, including for the crimes that un are under the purview of the International Criminal Court, court near, namely war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and oppression. Uh, the second question: I mean, it seems to me uh, that uh, how the U.S. administration considers the red line is. Uh, sort of movable geometry so they keep on pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable they keep on pushing the red lines further and further in order to justify their lack of action vis-a-vis uh, -vis israel so i have no expectations from the current administration which is embroiled in this catastrophe in a way the words can can say, but justice can fix. And this is why I truly hope that justice will be allowed to just to have it course, you know. But when when they say that they, I mean, when they are asked of uh, child corpses and they say, well, no, I take offense because it seems that they are uh, told to condone this. How they consider the 35,000 people who have been killed in Gaza and according, of course, the Ministry of Health in Gaza, because over five wars, uh, this is the ministry which has provided the, the account of, of the victims. I mean, this is the civilian administration in Gaza, like it or not. And the UN have no reason to doubt about the credibility of those figures. There might be a, a, a deformity, but of course there is. A, I think that there are lower estimates than the reality because there is no capacity to count that the maimed, the the, the 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 injured as as it should in a normal system. So it seems to me that the the U.S. administration almost almost admits what Israel says that all Palestinians who have been killed they are largely uh, terrorists or human shields or collateral damage and this is in my view humanitarian camouflage they are using ihl international law jargon to to cover 
to cover up international crimes. You talk about in your report, and you just refer to it now, uh, humanitarian camouflage. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yes. Um, and this is really key to understand my uh, clear conclusions on the genocidal logic that has uh, characterized this last assault against Gaza. Because Israel does not deny to have done what it has done, but it explains it as it's law on it's a war against terror. It's a war against the terrorists. And well, if there are civilians who are who have been uh, killed, well, look at the percentage. It's not that high compared to other words. The cynicism of these statements is incomprehensible to me. But again, they say. If there are civilians who are killed, well, this is because uh, Hamas uh, hides itself behind civilians and there are human shields. And occasionally, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there are collateral damage. This is so cynical and sinister. And this is why I say Israel has given itself a license to kill and justifying it by using international human humanitarian law concepts like human shields, excuse me, it is to be proven. It cannot be a blanket argument that you use against anyone. Where is the evidence that Hamas has used human shields? You cannot confuse urban terrain, the guerrilla type of combat with hiding voluntarily behind the civilian objects. I mean, no one, I'm not saying that Hamas has not done it, I'm not saying that this cannot be used as a blanket argument to say Hamas fights from uh, from within Gaza, which is one of the most densely populated areas in the world, as a justification to kill everyone. Because, again, you need to, first of all, to prove that human shields were used. And also, you need to take precautions. The other thing is Israel has used concepts like uh, Warnings. We have warned the people that they had to leave. We have given you evacuation orders. Let's take the order that was given in November to 1.1 million people living in northern Gaza to evacuate. What is this? I mean, this cannot be an evacuation order. First of all, because you tell people where they have to go. There is a camp. It is established. You will have roofs on your head. You will have medical facilities. You will have food. You will have water. None of this has happened, but also you cannot order 1.1 million people to leave a given area, otherwise they will be considered immediately ex officio accomplices with Hamas and terrorism. Because in that area there were 22 hospitals full of not only patients, nurses, doctors, other, other medical personnel, but IDPs. They were in northern Gaza, which had already been heavily bombed uh, at the time the evacuation order was given. They were disabled people, uh, women with children, old elderly people. How they were supposed to leave while, again, Gaza was being bombed. And also, they were told to, give, to, to go to safe zones, which were bombed uh, at the same time as people were ordered to move there. 42% of the designated, 42% of the bombs over the first three months fell over um, uh, safe zones, you know? And again, also military, uh, sorry, hospitals have been accused to be military objectives because allegedly Hamas personnel was in there. And it boils down to the to the most important argument. Israel has said that this war was a war against Hamas. What does it mean? Because Hamas is not just a, a combatant force, Qassam brigades or any other militant groups. In international humanitarian law, under the law of war, you can only kill active combatants, who, meaning combatants who are actively fighting. So if a combatant or a soldier is uh, enjoying the weekend with a family, you cannot target them. This is the rule. But again, only when they represent a threat. Instead, Israel has interpreted, as Israeli investigative journalist ha has reported, that everyone remotely affiliated to Hamas, including doctors, people who are in the civil administration, 
doctors, uh, university staff, engineers, uh, teachers, everyone who could be remotely associated to Hamas civil administration has been a target. And uh, so, you see, this is the very logic of this war has been genocidal and there has been a distortion of the basic provisions of international law, the principle of distinction between combatants and, non and civilian, between civilian objects and military objects, even buildings that were inhabited by people who were affiliated to Hamas, where their family members were living, had been bombed. And also the principle of precautions. No precautions were taken. No proportionality on the in the military action was, uh, uh, was ensured. And this is why I say they knew they knew this would result in killing. They knew that this would resu result in immense uh, physical and, and mental harm. They knew that by declaring a siege with no food, no water, no fuel, no medicines, people would be destined to die because these are conditions calculated to bring about the destruction of the group in whole or in part. And this is why it's genocide. And what do you say to the argument, which is very widespread inside the U.S., that, well, Israel has the right to defend itself. Hamas broke the ceasefire on October 7th, uh, and uh, that Israel is not an occupying power in Gaza because it disengaged in 2005, which I know is ridiculous, but it's, it's something many yeah. people argue in the U.S. political media establishment. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Well, very grateful to Francesca Albanese for joining us. That was very powerful. She takes a lot of risks doing what she does. It's not easy to be a prominent uh, UN official being so clear-eyed when it comes to this mass murder campaign. As we talked about, when people do try to hold Israel to account, they get threatened, as we saw with the International Criminal Court right. just recently confirmed that the former chief prosecutor was threatened by Israel. So Francesca is very brave for doing what she does. You also get smeared as an anti-Semite, which um, the State Department was eager to do with Francesca. Totally baseless smear. But those are just some of the things you face when you dare to speak out on Israel. So very grateful to her. And to see the full interview with Francesca, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. And you'll also get, of course, the Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness. We will see you next week. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.